I think there's a pretty good chance that you've heard of Martin Kleppmann. Now, he's a distributed systems researcher at the University of Cambridge, author of the O'Reilly book, Designing Data Intensive Applications, and as it turns out, the most important ideas in streaming, I find out, end up coming from Martin. Now, that's maybe, uh, maybe he wishes I hadn't said that, but it's actually true. And uh, this next talk, I think, is a particularly compelling argument that he has to make that you really need to hear. So, Martin. Hello, everybody. It's lovely to be here. Thank you, Tim, for the introduction. So I would like to start with a maybe slightly contentious question, which is whether Kafka is a database. I mean, I imagine a lot of you will have opinions about what is and is not a database. Some people will come back immediately and say, well, duh. Kafka has no tables, it has no data models, it has no secondary indexes. What on earth makes you think that it is a database? It does not look like a database at all. The only things you can do with it is publish to streams and consume those streams. And you would be right to an extent, but you would also be missing some rather interesting, important ideas. And so maybe just bear with me for the next 20 minutes and we will try to explore some of those ideas. So to start, we have to actually define a bit more carefully what we actually mean with a database. What is it that makes a database a database? And for the purposes of this talk, the definition I'm going to use is a database is a thing that provides asset properties. So you have probably heard of these in the context of relational databases. The properties are atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And I'm going to go through each of those in a bit more detail and see what those terms might mean in the context of something like Kafka. So I'm going to start with the D of acid, durability, because that's the easiest in a way. So back in the early 80s, when this acid acronym was defined, what it meant to have durability back then was that you take your transaction log from your database and you write it to an archive tape. That was the way that durability was achieved back then. Now, tapes have somewhat fallen out of fashion, and so over the years, this has become redefined, and so more recently, people take durability as meaning the data has been synced to disk, so it has been F-synced in a way that even if that disk loses power, you don't lose the data that you have written to it. And that's a reasonable definition of durability. More recently, again, as we've moved more and more to distributed systems, we've again redefine durability and now often take it to include replication. That is, the data is durable if it's not been only written to one machine, but actually to more than one machine, so that even if you lose an entire server, you don't, you don't lose that data. So those things are uh, part of durability, and of course Kafka provides both of those. Kafka will write all messages to disk and it will replicate them across multiple brokers. So I would say it provides durability under that definition. The last part of durability is perhaps uh, to keep in mind that often if you have data that you don't want to lose, you would set up some kind of backup system so that even if somebody accidentally deletes something, you don't actually lose it. Now, the backup is not really a feature of the database or the system itself. It's a feature of how you deploy it. Uh, but certainly, you could deploy Kafka in a way where you back up all of the messages that you write to Kafka. And so, again, this provides durability. So that's all I want to say about durability. It's fairly straightforward. Let's move on to the A of ACID, which stands for atomicity. So, Atomicity is often informally described as an all-or-nothing guarantee. That is, when a transaction writes some data to the database, either all that data ends up being written or none, but you don't end up with some kind of half-finished state where only some of the data has been written, but the other part has not been. So we have to be a little bit careful with the word atomicity because, unfortunately, in different areas of computer science, it means different things. So you might have, for example, come across in the Java standard library, there's an atomic integer class, uh, which allows you to do things like atomically increment a counter, or atomically compare and set the value of uh, a variable. And this is not the type of atomicity that we mean in the context of ACID. 
So atomicity there is about multi-threaded programming and about concurrency. In the context of ACID, atomicity is not about concurrency. It is about how faults, how crashes are handled. So it means that even if something crashes, the server loses power, uh, the transaction aborts for whatever reason, if the transaction commits, then all of the data written by the transaction is durable. If the transaction aborts for whatever reason, then none of those rights are deemed to have happened. So this is the defin of definition of uh, atomicity in the context of ACID, and we will come back to concurrency when we come to the I, the isolation of ACID. So let me give an example where we need atomicity. So let's say you have a web app that needs to write data to several different systems. So to make this concrete, let's say it's an e-commerce website, you have a product catalog, and you store the contents of that product catalog in a database, quite obviously. Uh, you probably also have a cache which may have different presented uh, pre-queried versions of that data. So maybe you have a cache page containing, say, all of the products by, from a particular brand or so pre-aggregated so that you don't need to make a database query every time you want to look up this data. And then moreover, you might have something like a search index so that if the user performs a keyword search, types some keyword in the search box, that will be served by a separate index. And so some relational databases do have that kind of indexing built in, but often people will deploy it in a way that, for example, something like Elasticsearch or Solar is used as the indexing system, something like Memcached or Redis is used as the caching system, and some relational database might be used as the, as the primary data store. And so what happens if you need to write to any one of these, say you want to update the description of a product in the product catalog, that descri updated description will have to be written to all of these different systems. So let's take here as an example that uh, you want to update the description of a product, and we have time going from left to right in this diagram. And so the user who is updating this description maybe first writes that data to the database, and the database comes back and says, OK, that was successful. And then the user goes, OK, well, I have to also update these various cache entries, and I also have to update the search index so that people can find the product by those keywords. And maybe the update to the, to the cache works, but the update to the search index fails for whatever reason. So maybe the, the server is currently down, it's currently not able to process any uh, write requests, and so, well, what do we do in this case? What we want is atomicity. That is, we want that this update to description is written to either all of these systems or none of them, but we don't want some of them to be updated and some others to be left not updated. So, well, we could retry the write to the index, for example. Maybe it's recovered, but the index might be down for some longer period of time. So how long do you keep retrying? It's not really clear. Maybe it would be better to actually revert the change that you made to the database and to the cache. But now maybe some other users have already seen that new data that you've written, and so then reverting it again is rather confusing. Now, in general, there has been, uh, for decades, in fact, a technique to solve this kind of thing. It's called distributed transactions, and two phases commit is like the algorithm behind distributed transactions. And in principle, this algorithm allows you to achieve atomicity across these very different systems. However, in practice, it tends to not actually work very well, because in settings like this, you would need both the database and the cache and the index to all support some form of distributed transactions. And unfortunately, many of these systems simply don't. So Memcached or Redis do not support XA distributed transactions. Uh, something, like uh, something like Elasticsearch or Solar similarly do not support it. So you cannot do distributed transactions across these systems. Even with databases that do support them, often the performance is terrible and the operational characteristics are pretty bad. So people have had really bad experiences with distributed transactions, which is why I propose that we simply don't build systems this way, but we can actually rely on tools like Kafka to build these types of systems in a more resilient way. The way you would do that is if you want to write some data to the database and the cache and the search index, rather than writing it directly, you actually just package up the data that you want to write into a message and send that message to Kafka. 
And so this is just a single message. It just gets appended to the end of a log in some topic partition. And that is it. That message is either written or it's not written. Now, if that message is not written, nothing happens. If that message is written, then consumers will see it. And so you could now have three different consumers, one consumer that updates the database, one consumer that updates the cache, and a third consumer that updates the search index based on those events, based on those messages that appear in Kafka. And because the message is either there or it's not there in Kafka, if it's there, then all of these consumers will see it, and all of these consumers will eventually apply that message. And so this way we actually get atomicity, we get the all-or-nothing guarantee if the message appears in Kafka. It will eventually get written to all three of these systems. If one of the systems has an outage temporarily, say the index stops processing writes for a while, that's all right. The messages are still there in Kafka. Once the system is repaired and it comes back up again, it will just churn through the backlog and process any of the messages that uh, have accumulated during the time while it was down. And because all of these different systems apply the rights in the same order, they are actually going to end up in a consistent state with respect to each other. Let's look at another example of atomicity. So in a relational database, if you look at any database textbook, this is like the standard textbook example that you always see for atomicity, which is a transfer of money from one bank account to another. So the way you would typically do that is you start a transaction, you update, the account 12345, and you reduce its balance by 100 pounds, and then you go over to the, the other account with ID uh, 54321, and you increase its balance by 100 pounds, and then you commit the transaction. So this here is a standard example of atomicity because atomicity is really important in this transaction, because if only one of these two rights were to happen, that would mean that your system is either having money disappear into the ether, or it's creating money out of thin air. And both of those are things that we don't normally want of an accounting system. They are considered to be bad, bad things. So we want atomicity. We want to either have both of these updates to happen or neither of them. So we know how we can do that in a relational database. We just wrap a transaction around it. Can we do a similar thing in Kafka? Well, it turns out we can. We'll use a very similar principle to what I talked about just now where we were updating the various different systems. Again, we will take the thing we want to do, in this case, the transfer of 100 pounds from 1 to 3, 4, 5, to 5, 4, 3, to 1, and we will just write that as a single message to a single Kafka topic. And this message just contains all the information we need, including the sender and recipient bank account, the amount, and some kind of unique identifier uh, which might just be a UUID or something like that, something that allows us to track that event as it flows through the system. So if that event gets written, then it can be picked up by a stream processor. And this will be a very simple stream processor. All it does is it sees, aha, we, here we have a transfer event. I'm going to output two other events. One is a debit event, one is a credit event. So the one event is the event that represents the reduction of an account balance by 100 pounds. And the other event is the increase of the account balance, the other account, by 100 pounds. And we can carry forward the same event ID as we had in the initial event. So now, even if the stream processor crashes, if it crashes halfway through processing this transfer message, so that means it might have, for example, written the debit event but not the credit event, that would be bad, because that would mean we're losing atomicity. But once this stream processor comes back up again, well, it will reprocess that message that was incompletely processed before it crashed. And so it will simply output the same event again. This is a very simple deterministic processor. So it's, it will simply produce duplicate events here. And any downstream code can now see, oh, we have multiple events with the same event ID. They must have got duplicated for some reason. We're just going to deduplicate de based on that event ID, and thus the, the problem goes away. Now, even if you're using the, the uh, exactly one semantics in Kafka streams, then you don't even need to worry about that because it actually handles this deduplication automatically for you. But anyway, we now have two separate events. If the transfer event was initially in the log, then these two e events, the debit and the credit, will both be in the downstream logs. 
And so we can now also partition those downstream logs by account numbers. And so that means that all of the events for account number one, two, three, four, five, they will all go into the same partition in Kafka. And so all those events will be processed by any consumers, and you can then have a consumer which actually does the update of the account balance and calculates the account statements and such like. And so that data can then be, writ can be read by some user who wants to know what is the account balance of a particular account. They can go to the appropriate partition and read the data there. So imagine maybe some of you will have noticed an issue that could happen here. So if the user is reading from both accounts, from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and from 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, what could happen here is that they see one of the two accounts before this update has happened and the other account after this update has happened. So note, this is not actually an issue of atomicity, because remember, atomicity is about ensuring that both happen even in the face of a crash, whereas looking at these events at one point in time, seeing one of them updated and the one other one not updated, that is a concurrency issue that falls under isolation. However, this is an, indeed an issue, and it can happen, but let me point out briefly that actually many relational databases, like Postgres, like Oracle, actually by default run at an isolation level called read committed, and read committed allows precisely the same thing to happen. So even if you're using a relational database, like Postgres or Oracle, that most of us would probably consider to have these ACID properties, unless you have specifically configured the isolation level to be stronger, to be a repeatable read or serializable, then you will have actually exactly the same issue that uh, somebody who's reading two different accounts may see one of the accounts before the update and the other after the update. So we have atomicity, and I spoke already slightly about isolation. This is about dealing with concurrency. So ideally, in a database, the level of isolation that we want is what is called serializable isolation. And serializability means that if you have various people, various uh, clients accessing the database concurrently, the end result that those clients see is the same as if the transactions were performed one at a time in a serial order, where each transaction has the entire database to itself. So serializable simulates the fact that uh, there is actually no concurrency, even though in reality there is concurrency going on. And serializability is really useful if you want to maintain various consistency properties in your database. So let's have another example. Take again a relational database in which you have users who can register usernames, and you want each user to have uh, each username to be unique. That is, you never want more than one user with the same username to exist in the database. And so you might implement it in this way that you start a transaction. First of all, you look how many accounts do we have for username Jane, and if this query returns zero, then it is safe to insert a new user account with username Jane, and you can commit that transaction. And if everything is serializable, this will mean that there will never be more than one user username uh, with the same name Jane in the database. However, if the database is, if the isolation is not serializable, you could end up with something like the following. You could have the light blue user who queries the database for username Jane, returns zero results. Then the purple user comes along, makes the same query, also returns zero results. Now the light blue user at the top actually inserts the new user for username Jane. Then the purple user, well, it also saw zero results to its first query, so it also thinks it's safe to perform this insertion, both transactions commit, and now we've got two users with the same username in the database. This is exactly the problem we wanted to prevent in the first place. So in a relational database, if you want to prevent this, you can bump up your isolation level to serializable, and it will deal with this. Uh, of course, you can have other things like a uniqueness constraint on the database as well, and that will help enforce it. Can we do a similar thing in Kafka? Well, we can. So let's take exactly the same username registration example. We have two users here at the bottom, the red one at the top, the, the greenish blue one, and they're both trying to register the same name, Jane. And so we have both of those clients that are trying to register the username 
send a message to a Kafka topic. Now, this Kafka topic we can partition, and we're going to use the username as the partitioning key. And so this means that any two requests for the same username are going to go into the same partition. But requests for different usernames can go into different partitions. And so by routing all of the requests for the same username into the same partition, if you remember the way how Kafka partitions works, any consumer that reads the messages in a partition is going to see those messages in the same order. That is like a fundamental property that Kafka provides. And we can use this property of ordering. So this ordering here means that in that partition, either the red user's request or the blue user's request will come first. We don't know necessarily which of the two comes first, but we know that anyone who consumes this topic will see them in the same order. And so everyone will agree on which one it was that came first. So let's say, for example, that the red one came first. And so you can now have a stream processor, again, which takes that topic, it consumes it, and it maintains a little database in which it records which usernames have been taken. And so the red user's message comes first, the stream processor checks its database, sees Jane, nope, no entries for Jane, fine. It emits a second message to another topic saying that username registration was successful. Then the green user's message comes along, gets processed by the same single-threaded stream processor. And now that stream processor has an entry in its local database saying, oh, sorry, I allocated the name Jane already. So to the second user, it now outputs a message saying, error, sorry, that username is taken already. So what we have achieved here, simply by relying on the ordering of messages in a Kafka topic partition, we have achieved the same thing as serially, serializably executing this transaction here because the stream processor for each individual partition is just a single-threaded, linear, sequential process, we get serializability because it is, in fact, serial, but we still get the scalability by being able to do lots of partitions in parallel because different usernames, they don't interfere with each other. They can just go into different partitions. So that's handled the durability, the atomicity, and the isolation just leaves C, the consistency. And this is a little bit of an odd one out in the acid properties, because, in fact, the, uh, the consistency property is, is a property of the application using the database. It's not so much a property of the database itself. So typically, consistency is understood as meaning that you can enforce certain constraints or invariants, and if transactions modify the database, then those constraints remain true. So we saw just now having a unique username is a constraint on the database. You want there to be no duplicates. You might imagine a similar constraint would be if you're selling seats in a theater, then you don't want more than one person being sat on the same seat. That would get uncomfortable. Same thing about selling seats on an airplane. You don't want to give the same seat to more than one customer. These are all examples of essentially the same thing. There's a uniqueness constraint that we want to maintain. Another example of an invariant might be in a financial application that an account balance must never go negative. And this, again, is actually essentially the same thing as the unique username example. You want to serialize all of the transactions for a particular account and make sure that none of them takes the balance negative, that anyone does try to take it negative, it would get an error. So where does this leave us? We've talked through the four asset properties. Does this make Kafka a database now? Depends a bit what you mean, of course. My preferred definition would be maybe that it's not exactly a database, but Kafka gives you the building blocks that allow you to do something that looks very much like transaction processing in a way that looks a bit like a database built out of Lego block components. Those Lego blocks are, in fact, streams, queues that are uh, connected with each other through Steam processors. And so you can, rather than writing a transaction using SQL, what you would instead do is break that logic down into this pipeline of stream operators. Now, I recognize that this is a more complicated, it's a more low-level programming model than simply writing an SQL transaction. On the other hand, it does have the nice property that it scales amazingly well and the performance is excellent because we're just relying on Kafka and Kafka Streams' own performance and throughput, and they are excellent. 
And as I showed you today, we can actually achieve some rather strong consistency properties. In fact, stronger consistency properties than you get from many distributed data stores that might call themselves databases. So if consistency properties are what makes you think that it makes a database a database, then we're actually not too far off here. If you find these, these ideas interesting, if you want to go a bit deeper, we wrote an article about this, which you can find online under the title of Online Event Processing. Our idea here is that this is actually a different way of building systems. We have online transaction processing, OLTP, we have OLAP, and it seems like there's this emerging third way here, which we call OLAP, OLAP uh, Online Event Processing, uh, which is taking these transaction processing-like ideas and implementing them on top of event-based systems. So that's all for today. I hope you found these ideas interesting. The last thing I wanted to just briefly mention is that I will be giving away signed copies of my book later on at 1 p.m. at the Confluence stand. So see you there if you're interested in one of those. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.